You're listening to an Axe Church sermon. If you haven't heard of Axe Church before, we are a church in Camas, Washington. You can check us out at axecamas.org. You can see what we're about and what we're up to. We're glad you're listening today and hope you enjoy this sermon. In April of 1963, Martin Luther King Jr. was taking part in the Birmingham campaign. And the Birmingham campaign was uh, a number of coordinated marches and sit-ins against racism and against segregation. And the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference organized this event, this campaign. And a judge in Birmingham had issued an injunction And the injunction said they could not march, they could not picket, they couldn't demonstrate, they couldn't boycott, uh, no trespassing and all the rest of it, and said that better not happen. It's against the law, but Martin Luther King Jr. and the other leaders of the Birmingham Birmingham campaign said, well, we're not going to obey that. This is an attempt to stop us from seeking justice, and I'm not going to follow that ruling. Instead, we're going to have some civil disobedience here. Nonviolent, no violence, just, just, just demonstrating, bringing a light to the injustice that was going on. Well, what happened was the police ended up roughly arresting Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. They placed him in a dark cell with no mattress, didn't give him a phone call. And, and an ally of, of Dr. King's, while he was in the cell there, smuggled him in a newspaper. And in this newspaper, he read an, an article, a statement that had been written by eight religious leaders. Uh, and the statement was called, A Call for Unity. And these leaders were basically saying, listen, why don't we find some other way, some other way to seek redress for the injustice and the oppression that's going on? Why don't we find some, a way that's not quite such a mess? Why don't we find some way that doesn't involve breaking the law? Why don't we find some way to sort of, let's negotiate, let's, let's do this type of thing. And Dr. King, as he sat in a prison cell for his nonviolent civil disobedience against absolute injustice, decided to pen a letter and, and wrote this letter in longhand. First, he started writing it on the newspaper that he had, and when he ran out of space from that, there was a, a trustee, a black trustee in the jail who was a nice guy who got him some, some uh, scraps of paper, and he continued to write this letter longhand. And eventually, his attorneys were able to see him, and they allowed him to leave a pad with him, and he finished this almost 7,000-word letter from a Birmingham jail, responding to the objections of these religious leaders who were saying, let's just kind of keep the status quo. And this is some of what Dr. King said. Let me rush on to mention my other disappointment. I have been disappointed with the white church and its leadership. Of course, there are some notable exceptions. I am not unmindful of the fact that each of you has taken some significant stands on this issue. I commend you, Reverend Stallings, for your Christian stand this past Sunday in welcoming Negroes to your Baptist church worship service on a non-segregated basis. I commend the Catholic leaders of this state for integrating Spring Hill College several years ago. But despite these notable exceptions, I must honestly reiterate that I have been disappointed with the church. I do not say that as one of those negative critics who can always find something wrong with the church. I say it as a minister of the gospel who loves the church, who was nurtured in its bosom, who has been sustained by its spiritual blessings, and who will remain true to it as long as the court of life shall lengthen. I had the strange feeling when I was suddenly catapulted into the leadership of the bus protest in Montgomery several years ago that we would have the support of the white church. I felt that the white ministers, priests, and rabbis of the South would be some of our strongest allies. Instead, some have been outright opponents. All too many others have been more cautious than courageous and have remained silent behind the anesthetizing security of stained glass windows. I have heard numerous religious leaders of the South call upon their worshipers to comply with a desegregation decision because it's the law. But I have longed to hear white ministers say, follow this decree because integration is morally right and the Negro is your brother. In the midst of a mighty struggle to rid our nation of racial and economic injustice, I have heard so many ministers say, those are social issues which the gospel has nothing to do with. 
There was a time when the church was very powerful. It was during that period that the early Christians rejoiced when they were deemed worthy to suffer for what they believed. In those days, the church was not merely a thermometer that recorded the ideas and principles of popular opinion. It was the thermostat that transformed the mores of society. Wherever the early Christians entered a town, the power structure got disturbed and immediately sought to convict them for being disturbers of the peace and outside agitators. But they went on with the conviction that they were a colony of heaven and had to obey God rather than man. They were small in number, but big in commitment. They were too God-intoxicated to be astronomically intimidated. They brought an end to such ancient evils as infanticide and gladiatorial contest. Things are different now. The contemporary church is so often a weak, ineffectual voice with an uncertain sound. It is so often the arch supporter of the status quo. Far from being disturbed by the presence of the church, the power structure of the average community is consoled by the church's often vocal sanction of things as they are. But the judgment of God is upon the church as never before. If the church of today does not recapture the sacrificial spirit of the early church, it will lose its authentic ring, forfeit the loyalty of millions, and be dismissed as an irrelevant social club with no meaning for the 20th century. I meet young people every day whose disappointment with the church has risen to outright disgust. I hope the church as a whole will meet the challenge of this decisive hour. We will win our freedom because the sacred heritage of our nation and the eternal will of God are embodied in our echoing demands. Now, there are two cultures of Christianity that are highlighted in what Dr. King has said here in in his letter. The first culture is the culture of Christ. Strong since the resurrection with power, with its foundations in God, in the teachings of Christ, in radical grace, and the work of Jesus in Scripture. There's that kind of culture. And the second culture is the culture of the church of Laodicea, which if you were here earlier, you would know that some believe that that's the age that we're in. And this is what is written to the church of Laodicea. Revelation 3, 14 through 17. And to the church, uh, and to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth, because you say, I am rich. I have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor blind and naked. There was the culture of the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, representing that culture of Christ and then standing against these unjust laws meant to divide, meant to create a ladder on which we put people in society, sometimes by nothing more than the color of their skin, fighting against that as against the very nature of God. And then there's the other folks, those who saw the evil of the latter. They recognized that, that that's what society was trying to do, that that was wrong. But they lacked the fortitude to tear it down for fear of something. It is the second culture that has given the skeptic arguments against the Christian worldview. Whether it's racism or sexism or nationalism, those looking from the outside at the church with a skeptical eye have seen plenty to complain about. So the question to answer for the skeptic and the check on the heart of the believer is this. Are Christ followers intolerant racists and sexists? Some would say yes. In 1963, Dr. Martin Luther Luther King Jr. spoke at Western Michigan University in a question and answer session. After a speech that he had given, he said this, we must face the fact that in America, the church is still the most segregated major institution in America. At 11 o'clock on Sunday morning, when we stand and sing, we stand at the most segregated hour in this nation. This is tragic. And 
I wish I could say that a lot had changed, but in 2015, Bob Smiatana wrote this. Sunday morning remains one of the most segregated hours in American life, with more than eight in ten congregations made up of one predominant racial group. And most worshipers like it that way. Two-thirds of American churchgoers, 67%, say their church has done enough to become racially diverse. And less than half think their church should become more diverse. As Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, this is tragic. And why is it tragic? Why? Right? After all, for all of history and all over the world, people from every culture, every worldview, and whatever have been racists. Right? That's been very common. Why is it tragic then that the Christian church hasn't stood up like it should against racism when so many other people are also racist? Why is it tragic that the male leaders of Christian churches have been exposed, has been revealed, that they've been oppressing women, whether it's their wives or other leaders in the church, sexually aggressive towards women in their churches? Why is that a tragedy? When we know that all over culture and for all of time, it's happened with lots of people, why is it so tragic that it's happening that there are racists and that there are sexists within the church. It's tragic because it is a violence against the scriptures. It's tragic because it is hostile to the teachings of the Bible and Jesus Christ. Absolutely hostile. Listen to Galatians 3, 27 through 28. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. The culture that allows for racism and sexism is a culture that strikes against the heart of the Christian worldview. That's why it's tragic when we see it in the church. For the skeptic that sees Christianity as intolerant, as backwards, as against racial reconciliation, as against women, I just want to say honestly, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that you got that impression. I'm sorry that it is no, I have no doubt in my mind that we ourselves as a church, not necessarily any individual person, but as a church, as a whole, we have failed to continuously speak plainly, loudly, forcibly, forcibly and unmistakably on these issues. We've simply failed to do that to the, to the degree that we should have. And that has provided ammunition for the skeptic to look at our hypocrisy and say, maybe the whole thing just isn't true. But let me make something clear. Our failure as the church, as people who are claiming to be Christ followers and so on, our failure is not the failure of the Bible. It's not the failure of the Christian worldview. It's not the failure of Christ. It's our failure. It's a failure of ignorance and passivity and fear that too many of us have accepted the status quo the way that things are. And it's been easier to keep that going than to stand up and fight for the things that need to be fought for. And for those of you who have looked at Christianity from the outside and said, there's things I like here, but that, that I don't like, I'm sorry that you've seen that. But let me be clear, that has nothing to do with Christianity. That's the kind of mistakes that humans make. Not the kind of thing that Christ has called for. Too few of us have passionately stood and worked for the kind of radical equality and servanthood that we have been called to as Christ followers. And that's the bottom line. Now, having admitted that, the question remains, is this intolerance, this racism, this sexism, is it inherent in Christian belief? The answer is a resounding no. No, it is not. The truth is that the Bible and the teachings of Jesus are truly the only, listen carefully, the only real voice for radical equality that the world has ever heard. Let that sink in for a minute. I'm going to prove it in a second. The, the truth is that the Bible and the teachings of Jesus are the only radical voice for equality that has ever been heard in this world. Now, Christopher Hitchens was an atheist. He, he passed away. Um, but he was one of the kind of the new atheists, right? These guys who have written books lately, popular books that make fun of Christianity and so on. One of the things he said is this. Violent, irrational, intolerant, allied to racism, tribalism, and bigotry. He's describing religion. Invested in ignorance and hostile to free inquiry, contemptuous of women and coercive toward children, and it ought to have a great deal on its conscience. 
That's what Christopher Hitchens says about religion. This is a scathing indictment of religion, and it may even be true about some religions. I don't defend those ones. But as to the Christ follower, what he's saying there is simply nonsensical. It's simply nonsensical. Because here's the thing. The first question we always have to ask when these kinds of denunciations are made against Christian believers is from where do you get the rules Where do you get the rules from which you're using to judge Christianity? You're saying these things are bad, right? You're saying that the rules are against that. Hitchens, others, they've painted Christianity as essentially evil. Why religion poisons everything. It's the subtitle of his book. You know, Christians are evil. They're morally corrupt. The world would be better off if everyone just jettisoned their Christian beliefs. That's the mantra of the new atheist. But there's there's a problem There's no reason to believe that those claims, that if we got rid of Christianity, things would be better, are actually true. In fact, the opposite is true. And how do I know? I don't have to go to Christians or a Bible college or a pastor to find that out. I can go to other atheists. There's a French atheist named Luke Ferry. This is what he says. The Greek world was fundamentally an aristocratic world, a universe organized by hierarchy, in which those most endowed by nature should in principle be at the top which the less endowed saw themselves occupying inferior ranks. In direct contradiction, this is an atheist speaking, in direct contradiction, Christianity was to introduce the notion that humanity was fundamentally identical, that men were equal in dignity, an unprecedented idea at the time, and one to which our world owes its entire democratic inheritance. The idea of equality may seem self-evident, but it was literally unheard of at the time, and it turned an entire world order upside down. Another atheist, Chris Berg, says this, virtually all, virtually all the secular ideas that non-believers value have Christian origins. It was the theologians and religiously minded philosophers who developed the concepts of individual and human rights. Same with progress, reason, and equality before the law. It is a fantasy to suggest that these values emerged out of thin air once people started questioning God. Yet, many modern human rights activists seem to believe that human rights sprang forth, full-bodied, and with a virgin birth in United Nations treaties in the mid-20th century. Nothing could be further from the truth. The idea of human rights was founded centuries ago on Christian assumptions advanced by biblical argument and advocated by theologians. Modern supporters of human rights have merely picked up a set of well-refined ethical and moral arguments. Where do you get the rules that you're using to judge Christianity? Well, from Christianity, which is a problem. It means that Contrary to the position of some popular atheists that those that look to the mistakes of some Christians that we've talked about, right, instead of looking at the teachings of Christ, and then they make all these, say all these things about how bad Christianity is, the fact is that Christianity is the reason, the main reason, the only reason that we believe there should be equality in the first place. That's it. It's from Christianity. The idea that equality is good, that slavery is bad, that women are of equal value to men, These are found in the Christian faith. They are not atheist ideas. They're not. They're not secular at all. They originate and continue to find their power in the teachings of the one who said that he was God and rose from the dead. That's where they come from. That's where they continue to find their power. Period. Without that foundation, these ideas would never have come to be popular. These ideas would never have been found by us. In the 300s AD, a very long time ago, Gregory of Nyssa, one of the major Christian leaders of the, of the time, wrote this about slavery. You condemn a person to slavery whose nature is free and independent, and in doing so you lay down a law in opposition to God, overturning the natural law established by him. For you subject to the yoke of slavery one who was created precisely to be a master of the earth and who was ordained to rule by the creator as if you were deliberately attacking and fighting against the divine command. Now, this seems obvious today, right? Slavery is bad. No, no, no problem, no brainer. Here's the problem. At that time, nobody was saying that. Nobody. 
The world, this is the first that we basically have of somebody who is saying the institution of slavery is evil and it's wrong. It's literally a violation. It's hostile to who God is. It's hostile to the way that God made things. This is the first that it comes from. Where does it come from? An enlightened atheist? No. It comes from Christianity because it's the only place it could come from. No one was saying this. Slavery was entrenched. It was entrenched in every culture. It was Christian thought that formed this belief. It is the Bible that informed this belief. It was Christians like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., like Frederick Douglass and Rosa Parks and William Wilberforce and Sojourner Truth and John Wesley. It's these kind of people who wrote and spoke and fought against injustice and racism. They're the ones who fought against inequalities, against people who wanted to create a ladder and put some people on top of it and some people on the bottom of it. They said, this is not of God. This is not the way God created the world. You were created in the, in the image and the likeness of God, and that means something. And without that, you never would have had it. No one had it. Christian thought is still setting people free from that latter system of discrimination that has always been the default for people. It's still doing that to this day. In Nepal where the caste system still holds sway, which, which is, as many of you may know, the caste system says, if you're born into this caste, you're up here. If you're born into this caste, and so on and so forth. And if you're the very lowest, you're a Dalit, an untouchable. You clean the toilets. You don't, you don't eat next to me. You don't, you don't go get the same water source that I've got. You have to live outside the town. The Dalits, the untouchables, are the very lowest in the caste system. It didn't work out very well for them. They're on the bottom rung of the ladder. And many people in Nepal are turning to Christ. Dalits are turning to Christ in record numbers. This is what uh, the Nepal record said in an article. Some Dalit converts see Christianity as a way to escape the caste system. According to the Federation of National Christian, Nepal, as many as 65% of Christians are Dalits. As one Dalit Christian pastor in a village near Manahari said, the higher caste in the village used to treat dogs better than us. And generally, they still do. But among Christians, there is no discrimination. We are all equal. There's freedom in Christ. Christian belief sets people free. It is Jesus Christ who raised up women as valuable and special and equal in dignity and value to men. That was unheard of. As the atheist that, you, that, that I read told you, unheard of, did not happen, turned the world upside down or right side up as we see it now. These ideas came from one place. It was Jesus who taught us that all were equal, that we should do unto others as we would want them to do unto us. It was Jesus who taught us that greatness was not about wealth, it wasn't measured by power and lord and authority, but by serving others, unheard of. These teachings have led to the very ideas that these new atheist authors rely upon to criticize Christianity. It's these ideas that came from Jesus Christ that are being relied upon to criticize Jesus Christ. The Bible is where we learn that all people are created in his image and likeness. That's in the Bible. It isn't anywhere else. It is from that teaching that the rest of the teachings in the Bible flow. That all the ideas of human dignity and human rights, they all flow from Scripture and from the idea that God has created you special and he's created you valuable. This is, this is important. If you're a skeptic, you're listening or you're here this morning or you're here on the radio or whatever it is, I want you to think about something. You have to ask yourself a couple important questions. Why do I believe that human beings have value? What basis do I have to believe that? Why do I believe, what basis do I have to believe that we should work towards racial reconciliation? Why do I believe that men and women are equal in dignity and value? Why do I believe that? Please, please recognize whoever you are and whatever, you've come, whatever worldview you've come in here with. Recognize that the morals that you value the most in your life come from Christianity. They do not come from anywhere else. They simply don't. They simply don't. And if you want to jettison Christianity, I'm sorry, but you, you lose all ability to hold on to those morals because that's where they're rooted. 
You can't get these morals from karma. That's what creates caste systems. You can't get them from scientific atheism. They can't come from evolution. They can only come from Christ. You ought to believe these things. You ought to. And you ought to act consistently with them because they are true and right. But you have no basis to believe them. You have no basis to believe them other than Jesus Christ. There's nothing to ground them in. And here's the thing that you, that you need to understand. You cannot take only half of Jesus. He doesn't leave that option open. The half Jesus option is not open. The, well, I'll take some of this. I like what he said about this, but I don't like what he said about that. I don't like his call to that. This seems kind of radical, but I like this over here. That doesn't work. Jesus based these things, the things that he told us, his teachings are based on the idea that you were created in the image and likeness of God. And, and Jesus was God. So when he's coming to us and he's telling us these things, there's a reason why they seem so true. There is a reason why there was nothing like it ever before. There's a reason why it turned the world up inside, upside down. And there's a reason why 2,000 years later it still is doing that. It's still bringing that. Because Jesus was God. Jesus is the only one who can or will judge because he's the only one who knows and created you. And he created the law of human value and dignity on which we base human rights social justice, all the things that, that people say they care about, those are all from Christianity. Will Herberg, a Jewish philosopher and sociologist of religion, he used a term called cut flower culture. Cut flower culture. Now think about this. Sometimes I give my wife flowers because I am super nice. <laughs> and... I get tired eventually of sleeping on the couch. So sometimes I bring her flowers. When the flowers come, they're beautiful, right? But they've been cut from their roots, right? They don't have the foundation anymore. They still smell good. They still look good for a while. But eventually they turn brown and kind of nasty and maybe get a little mold on them. It depends on how long we keep them around, right? Um, or throw them outside and the dogs mess with them, whatever. But eventually they die. Eventually they die because when the flower is cut from its root, it has no ability, no foundation for food, nourishment, nourishment, sustenance. It will no longer grow. It might be pretty for a little while, but then it dies. For the skeptic who wants to retain the moral notion of equality, this is important who wants to say that racism is really bad and tolerance is really good. If you want to say that and you're a skeptic about Christianity, you have two choices. One, embrace Christianity. Two, wait for the flower to die. That's it. Because you cannot hold on to a moral truth once it's been severed from its foundation. Now it has no logical reason for you to believe it. It was really beautiful when you saw it here, but when you pulled it out and destroyed the thing that made it, it's just a flower. It might look beautiful. It might smell good for a little while, but soon you're going to realize you don't have any reason to obey it, and it's going to die because a worldview has to be comprehensive and coherent, and when you pull moral truths away from their foundations, they are not coherent any longer. That means worldviews need to answer all the questions that are answerable, and they need to do it in a way that they all make sense together. Atheism, agnosticism, and every other worldview that I know of besides Christianity fails at both of these. They're neither comprehensive and answering all the questions that can reasonably be answered, nor are they coherent within the answers that they're giving. And this is one example of that. The fact is, you can work all day for equality and moral righteousness if you want to and you're an atheist, but you have no reason for doing so. If you're an atheist, if you don't believe in God, you can work for equality. I think it's great that you're working for equality. You just have no reason to do it. You just can't back up why you're doing it. You cannot give an explanation in science or philosophy without God for choosing to treat people with dignity and respect and love. You just can't. Try. The answer is only found in the loving God who both created you and loves you. That's it. That's the only place that you can base those beliefs. Without that, you are just a bunch of atoms, right? For the atheist, you're just a bunch of atoms. And here's the thing. With my dad bod, I have a lot more atoms than you probably do. So I guess I'm more important, right? 
what else would you base anything on? And don't laugh so hard at the dad bod thing. I, <clears throat> we're working. We're working on it. You have nothing to base morality on if there's no God. You have nothing to base these things that change the world on if you don't listen to the teachings of Jesus Christ. It's just simply not there for you. It's not there. But no one wants to live that way, right? No one wants to believe that love and value and justice are simply illusions. People don't like that. I don't blame them because they're not illusions. But societies that have gone down the road of cutting that flower away and jettisoning the root of Christianity have all ended up basically in one place. Oppression and death. Do the history search. Look it up. Look at countries that have jettisoned Christian beliefs and morals from their root and just said, we don't need God at all. We can just use these principles. It didn't take long before the principles weren't followed by anybody. And it just became a will to power. Who's stronger? Who's got more atoms? That's how it goes down. Every attempt to separate Jesus Christ as the risen son of God from morality and the foundation for ethics and the equality of all people has failed. Every attempt to do that. It's just not there. Because the flower will not live long without a root, an idea will not live long without its logical foundations. It is Christ and Scripture that give us a comprehensive and coherent worldview. They're the ones that give us a comprehensive and coherent explanation for why we should believe that human beings are valuable, that we should have equality. It's not an accident that all of these social justice issues have been championed and pushed through by believers, not by atheists. It is Christ and Scripture that give us the reasons, the reasons for the truth that racism and slavery and sexism and blind nationalism and hate are evil. It is from Scripture that we learn this. It is from Jesus that we learn this. And it is, here's another thing, okay? We're just going to take a little side trip here. Yeah, we're all right. It's the same moral truth. It's the same basis that actually causes one of the other big objections, especially with young people, to Christianity. So the same basis about the value of people that makes racism bad and sexism bad and whatever, that same thing says some other things are bad, which are actually just as big of objections against Christianity. One of them is sex. Oh, you woke up. Good. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Sex, right? Some people think that Christianity is against sex. And that could not be further from the truth since God created sex. Nevertheless, it is a persistent complaint that the idea of sex as a thing that should be shared between one man and one woman exclusively with one another for life in a marriage is stifling and prudish. It's backwards. But don't you understand that it's the same principles? The same principles of valuing people that are the reason that, that sex was created to exist within that context. On, the, on this page, God says, I have created them in my image and likeness. On the next page, he says, man and wife, and the two shall become one flesh. It's all related. It's all connected. The context for, the, the, for, for sexuality and where and when it ought to be done is related to the value of people, male and female. The idea of sexual immorality, adultery, pornography, incest, fornication, sex outside of marriage, all of those things, they defile and degrade the value of human beings. That's why they're wrong. The same reason that you should not have sex with someone that you're not married to and committed to for life is the same reason that you should not be a racist or a sexist. It's the same thing. It's about loving God's people who he made in his image. Marriage is about so much more than sex. It's a mystery. 
It's a mystery of two people learning to serve each other and model a picture of Jesus Christ in his church. Do you even get it? It's amazing. But it's all connected to the same thing. They're all branches on the same tree, and there's so much going on here, and there's so much to learn. But here's the thing. You cannot take half of Jesus. That option isn't open to you. You can't do it. You can't take something. It's not a buffet. Okay? Morality is not a buffet. If racism is wrong, so is sexual morality. If sexism is wrong, so is drunkenness. All of these things, whatever you want to list, good, you know, all the things that we're not supposed to do, they're not about what you're not supposed to do. They're about God's context for living life to its fullest and for honoring one another as valuable. You can't take one without the other. You can't go through the buffet and say, I, you know, I really like, uh, I'd like to save the earth. That looks good to me. They have some good rallies. They have good food there at their rallies. I'm going to go away from the vegan thing. That doesn't seem like my thing. And then, you know, go to the next thing, right? I, I, like, I like this. I, I think that we shouldn't be racist, but I think I'll drink to excess. I, you know, I don't think that we should be sexist, but, you know, I, I want to keep some pornography in my life. It doesn't work like that. You either accept what Christ has said about who you are and who everyone else is, or you reject it. You don't get to have it halfway. Or you're just inconsistent, and you should at least realize that about yourself. The Christian worldview is serious about the reality of morality because we understand who God is in Jesus Christ. We understand the gospel of grace. We understand that we have all messed this thing up. Every one of us. We're selfish. We suppress the truth and our righteousness. We're moral hypocrites. We rail against those people who do the kinds of evils that we hate while we make excuses and justify the kind of evils that we like. We know about that. As believers, we know all about that. That's why we understand that we need Jesus. Because he died and rose again, defeating death and hell and sin. And he loves us, and he's offering us his grace and our salvation from sin and death, which is where all that hypocrisy and all that nonsense is leading, is to death. This good news about Jesus, it's called the gospel, and it is the only true freedom from oppression and evil. Listen, the gospel is the only true freedom from oppression and evil. You will not find it anywhere else. It is the only true, coherent, and logical foundation for true love. Do you think you love your mother, your husband, your wife, your kids? you think you love them? The only way that love exists, that there's a true, coherent foundation for it, is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the revelation that God has shown us through his son, Jesus Christ. That's it. That's love. It doesn't exist anywhere else. Now, for the skeptic, the agnostic, the atheist, look, you either decide that you don't believe in love, that you don't believe in justice, decide that you don't believe in right and wrong, decide that racism and sexism and intolerance are not any better or worse than equality because you have no basis for which to judge them. Either decide that because you've decided that morality is an illusion or decide that you're going to search for the coherent, logical foundations of morality because you will only find objective truth and value and righteousness in Jesus Christ. So I welcome you to the search, because I know where it ends. For the Christ follower, this is not for the skeptic, but for us who follow Christ. Where's your heart? Are you quicker to defend your cultural assumptions or to listen with an open heart to the pleading of your minority brothers and sisters? Men, are you satisfied to joke around with your friends and wink with the guys in the office about women, negative things that are said about women, derogatory things that are said about women? Or are you fighting for the value and the honor of your sisters? You think you can say that you believe women are equally valuable before God and then flip on your phone or your computer to lust after someone else's daughter or sister? You think you can say you love everyone, regardless of their race, and deny the injustice and oppression that is rampant in our communities today? Pretend like 
It's okay. It'll work itself out. We don't have anything that we need to do as believers. You need to think about that. Do you think that God doesn't see? Do you think that Jesus is not going to stand up for those who cry out to him? we got to take it seriously. I love coming to church, and I love being here, and I love teaching the Word of God, and I love smiling and laughing and hugging and, and, and talking about, uh, you know, the great and wonderful things of God. But I also, I also have a heart that breaks for the fact that we, as those who most understand that all people are created in God's image and likeness, should be the ones shouting the loudest when the Me Too movement starts. Why are you treating our sisters this way? Have you not heard that Christ has said we're all equally valuable? Have you not heard that you should be submitting to your brother and to your sister? Why are we getting angry when someone brings up that there might be a problem with racial issues in this country and act like, well, we've come so far and we're better than other people? That's nonsense. As believers, it's not right until it's perfect. We're looking forward to a time when we will all be with Jesus, every nation, every tribe, every tongue, together. I don't want to be embarrassed in that moment. Hey, man, I'm sorry. I saw what was happening, and I knew it was right. But you know what? I was really comfortable. And yet I was wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I don't want that to be us. And I'm not saying it is. I'm saying don't let it be. Don't let it be because when the skeptic comes and is searching out Jesus Christ, the one that can give the skeptic life, when she or he is is here looking, and then they look around and they see these people say they believe these things. Jesus was radical about what he believed, about the value of men and women, every race, every creed, every gender. What he believed was radical, and these people don't seem like they are. So I wonder, do they even believe it? You don't want that question. I challenge us, all of us, starting with me. Are we listening? Are we working? Are we trying to create a more diverse church? Are we trying to create a more diverse community? Are we doing the things we need to do to lift up our own, the women in our own church, who have historically been held down and been put somewhere down the ladder, do you think that, we, that it's okay that now, because women have gotten a little bit higher on the ladder, that they should be satisfied with that? We're not satisfied until we all, until we kill the ladder. Forget us all being on top of the ladder. That seems dangerous. <laughs> they say you're not even supposed to step on that, like step underneath. I do it all this. Anyways, so I'm a crazy guy. The ladder needs to go. And all of us tend to be holding things in our hearts because it's easy, because it's the status quo. Like these eight religious leaders, I don't think that they were horrible people who said, let's just try a different way. Let's try a softer way. I don't think they were horrible people. But Dr. King understood what was needed and did what was needed. Let's be more like him and less like them. Listen, if you want to be great in God's kingdom, learn to be a servant. Humble yourself. Learn to be a servant to everyone. Matthew 20, 26, and it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. Keep that in mind. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Do not automatically take the cultural moment that you're in, and if it's a political thing or a social justice thing or whatever, snap to an immediate conclusion based on arguments that, that fly around on Fox News. That is not where we get our belief system. We don't get it from cable news. This is where it comes from. Ask yourself how much time you saw cable news this week and how much time you looked at these pages. If you want to know whether you're on the right track for understanding these issues. I'm calling us out. We need to repent for the things that we haven't done. We need to move forward in righteousness and justice We need to be people who truly represent Christ, who are radical like those early Christians who turned the world upside down. We owe everything to Jesus. 
These are his people. I hope that if you're a skeptic today, you've seen, I've tried to be honest about where we are as people, the mistakes that we make, but I've also tried to be clear about who Jesus Christ is. If you're looking for the only basis for real morality, for loving other people, and for equality, you'll only find that in Jesus. Let's pray. Well, thanks for listening to our sermon. Again, this has been a sermon from Axe Church in Camas, Washington. We hope you enjoyed it and got a lot out of it. If you did, you can subscribe to our channel as well as liking and commenting. We love to hear how these sermons are impacting you. You can also take a look at our podcast series that we have out. And we'll catch you again next week.